Severe depression and its various treatments, talk therapy, multiple medications, and electroconvulsive therapy may not be the most obvious topic for a musical. However, the Tony Award-winning play, Next to Normal, currently on stage in the provincial capital, delivers both as great theater and as a window into the mental health issues faced by sufferers and their families. With us now for more, Ma'an Janisho, who plays the main character, Diana Goodman, in the Mervish production, Next to Normal. Daphne Vonescos, staff psychiatrist, Temerty Center for Therapeutic Brain Intervention at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And Dr. Peter Jacoby, clinical head of the Harquail Center for Neuromodulation and a psychiatrist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. And it is so good to welcome everybody to the program and you two on the ends. Don't take this the wrong way. But I saw your play, Ma'an, yesterday. You are phenomenal, the play is phenomenal, and I'm so glad that you're here and can't wait to talk to everybody, but especially you about all this. Okay, here we go. Let's set this up. This is a play about a woman with severe depression. You play mm -hmm. the lead. She's got a lot of mental health issues. At some point, her psychiatrist says to her, electroconvulsive therapy, electroshock, as it is more familiarly called, is advised. So let's start there. What is ECT? ECT has been around for a long time. It's our most effective psychiatric treatment for uh, treatment-resistant depression, so for depression that has not responded to medication or talk therapy. It's one of our only procedural treatments in ECT, so as opposed to taking a pill, it's quite a bit more invasive. Um, but again, it's very effective. Up to 70% of people with treatment-resistant depression will respond to ECT. Can you put a little more flesh on that bone? Mm -hmm. What do you actually do? So uh, electroconvulsive therapy involves the application of a brief, short electrical stimulus to the scalp to induce a seizure under general anesthesia. Does it cause memory loss? So most of the uh, data would suggest that immediately after the treatment, there is some degree of memory impairment, and that may be due to the anesthetic, due to the procedure itself. But when you look at follow-up three to six months later, in general, people's memory improve. And part of the reason for that is when people are depressed, it can have a profound effect on their memory. And when you successfully treat their depression, that can improve. What does the evidence say about whether or not it causes any damage to the brain? There's no evidence that there is damage to the brain, uh, as far as we can tell. There is memory impairment uh, in the period of time around ECT and including the time that you have ECT up to a few months on either side can remain quite a bit fuzzy for people if they have memory impairment. I want to know how much you knew about all of this before you took on this role. Um, not very much when it comes to ECT. It's a, uh, just a very, very basic um, uh, knowledge or understanding. Um, also, uh, shared experiences from people who have administered ECT and who have received it. Um, and I, my understanding is it's, it varies with, with each person, like the degree in, uh, in which the, the therapy affects them or if it is actually effective for them. Um, just but as an actor, you, I, I presume you do some research into mm -hmm. every role that you get. Mm -hmm. What kind of research would you have done to get ready for like, this one? With her in particular, I just explored her character, not so much with, on the ECT level, but on the level of her grief and where it comes from. Because I think she mainly deals with the loss of her child at a very young age. And because, that it, because it was such a sudden loss, without her actual actually being able to have the coping mechanisms to deal with that mm -hmm. loss. Um, and then uh, I guess at the time that she was trying to deal with her grief, um, other options were presented to her and whether or not those options were the actually right thing for her or if it made the situation worse is, mm -hmm. um, is I guess what I had to explore as the character. Now, I presume you wanted to do this show because I mean, A, it's a great show, B, mm. it's a great character that you play, but, but sometimes actors have a, an actual personal connection to the subject matter. Do, do you in this case, or your family, or Absolutely. anything like that? Absolutely. I think that, uh, especially in society today, I, I think we would be hard-pressed to not have some kind of relationship with a mental health issue. I think as a society, it's, it's uh, definitely something that we need to address. It's, 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 I'm glad that people are actually talking more about it. Um, shedding light into the subject because there are so many, uh, there are varying degrees of, of um, depression and mental health issues. There's just too many to, to, 
to even start. There are some very clever lines in this play. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, uh, I'm no sociopath. I'm not Sylvia Plath. That's mm -hmm. a great lyric. Mm -hmm. Love that. And Peter, I wonder if you could tell me if this is true. Ma'an's got a line in the play that says, most people who think they're happy are just stupid. <laughs> is that the case? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. Uh, but we do know that about 10% of Canadians in their lifetime will be diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not uncommon to have depression. And when you extend that to other mood disorders, including bipolar disorder, maybe upwards of 15% of people. Hmm. It's almost 45 years ago that the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest came out. And I guess, sadly, that is most... I shouldn't say that. For a lot of people, that's going to be their, their sole exposure to electroconvulsive therapy. And it doesn't look too good in that movie. Can you talk about how accurate that portrayal of ECT was? Sure. So uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is remarkably one of the uh, most common images that people have when I talk about ECT, whether it's giving a lecture to medical students, although some of them now are too young for that movie, <laughs> um, uh, or in a conference or, some, or uh, to patients. And it's not very accurate. There are several parts of the movie that, uh, that do not reflect the way we deliver psychiatric treatment at all or ECT today. First of all, ECT was delivered to Jack Nicholson's character in, in the movie um, as a punishment. Uh, uh, very much against his yeah, will. Against his will. That does not happen. Um, no, we pay, patients or their substitute decision makers will consent for ECT always. Um, uh, it was to someone really without a psychiatric diagnosis. He was faking it mm -hmm. for the movie or, or for his character. Um, and without a general anesthetic, which we would not do uh, today. You have general anesthetic when you take ECT. Correct. It's a, a very heavy sedative, uh, similar to a general anesthetic or to something like you would have for a very heavy, sed heavily sedated colonoscopy. Huh. Have you seen Cuckoo's Nest? No, I Never saw the movie? No, no. I highly recommend it. It's a oh, fabulous movie. It is. It is really? a great movie, right? I mean, it may not be accurate, but it's a great movie. Have you seen it? I have. I actually use it as a clip uh, when mm -hmm. we're showing ECT to, uh, to students. So we have a clip from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, also a more recent example from House, where ECT is also portrayed in an in a inaccurate fashion. Hmm. Do you have, I don't, I'm so, I want to be so careful here that I don't do any of these mm -hmm. plot spoilers because I hate it when people, however, mm -hmm. when you do ECT in the play, mm -hmm. It's very dramatic. It is. The lighting is very dramatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. W was there ever a discussion about any qualms about portraying it in the way that you do? Always. There's always, um, uh, but at the same time, I guess you take liberties when you're in, in a theatrical mm -hmm. uh, uh, environment. And also, I mean, there's a line that she delivers <clears throat> about the anesthetic, right? About me counting 102. And then, when, once I'm under, what you actually see as a portrayal is, is sort of what happens in her mind. It, uh, I'm not actually physically awake. It's, it's one of those things. Should yeah. we let the people see your work? Please do. I think we should. <laughs> okay. Let's ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, if he would, to... Oh, you mean right now? Yeah, sure. We're going to show right. a clip. All right. That's okay, isn't okay, it? Okay, sure. Okay, good. Mon says I'm allowed to show a clip. <laughs> Sheldon, if you would. That you're falling, but you never hit the ground. It just keeps on coming at you day by day by day by day. You don't know, you don't know what it's like to feel that way. But I miss the mountain. I, I miss the lonely climb. Wandering through the wilderness and spending all Do you know how I know that you're a great actor? How? Because I've known you now for five minutes, and you are such a calm, mild-mannered person, and you're <laughs> actually a little bit shy, and I think you're a little bit nervous right yes. now. And you are so out there in the play. I mean, you are, right? I give you my heart. You sure do. Yes. You sure do. That clip just shows the tip of the iceberg of... I think how intense your performance has to be eight shows a week over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether or not this role takes any kind of psychological toll on you. Absolutely. It does. Uh, yes. I, I kind of learned 
sort of the long and hard way that what I do, I have to be able to, at the end of the day, tell my body that it's actually not happening to me. You know, when it comes to mental health, um, I did Miss Saigon for about eight and a half years of my life. So much so that if you're doing that show eight times a week for that long, your body actually thinks you're there or that mm. it's happening to you. So I like to, or from coming from that understanding, I now then physically, literally tell my brain that you're, I'm okay, I'm safe, this is not happening to me. Because then it counters the chemicals that were produced by your brain that is being processed in your body as real. But if, you're, if you say to your brain, it's not happening to you, then your brain is able to, to produce those other happy chemicals that, that let you know that you're safe. So it's, it's, it's a balance and I would, um, I highly advocate mental health and meditation like with, uh, with my colleagues because it's, it's very, very important because it, it does, it will take a toll if, if, you, if you don't have that practice. This opens up a whole new realm of practice, I think, for the two of you, mm. and that is in show business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Reminding or convincing mm. actors that they're actually not really going through what they're mm -hmm. kind of really going through mm -hmm. at that moment. There's a moment in the play where you are diagnosed by a psychiatrist, and Peter, I'll get you in on this. The psychiatrist says ECT is indicated. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could help us understand what conditions someone would need to present right. for ECT to be considered. Right, so ECT is a, an important treatment that we have uh, available to us in psychiatry. It's not for every condition. Most of the treatments that are provided in the province are for people with severe mood disorders and uh, also for people with psychotic disorders. Uh, in our Canadian guidelines, the CANMAT guidelines, it's listed as a second line treatment, but a first line treatment for people with certain features, including uh, prominent suicidal thoughts, uh, psychotic features and severe treatment resistance. Psychotic features would involve what? So uh, psychotic features can involve things like auditory hallucinations, uh, delusional beliefs, uh, perhaps that people are monitoring you or after you for some reason or targeting you or that something has gone bad or rotten in your body or even the belief that you're dead already. Mm -hmm. um, all of these sorts of things can be classified under delusional beliefs and psychotic symptoms. I have talked probably for 35 years to people in the anti-psychiatry movement who think this is awful. And you have your own experiences with, obviously, yourself mm -hmm. from a professional point of view. How do we resolve that debate? I think it's very difficult. Um, there's been a lot of stigma around psychiatry as a whole, around mental health and mental health disorders, and, and of course, around ECT. I think some of the most severe stigma has hit ECT. And we understand why. It seems uh, to be uh, one of the treatments that is the least understood by the public. And I think one of the things we can do is, is to continue to do what we've been doing, to just start talking about, about mental health, about mm -hmm. people struggle with mental health, and to see how we can try to decrease the stigma. Peter, how would, let me get you to weigh in mm -hmm. on that. How would you convince those who think that no good can come of this, right. that it can? So, uh, ECT has been around for about 80 years, so I think it's somewhat understandable that people have an older working model of what this treatment is. Uh, it's a dynamic procedure, so the science continues to evolve when it comes to ECT, and the practice has changed from one flew over the cuckoo's nest over the 60s and 70s. Mm. So I think when people come to uh, a clinical appointment where ECT is talked about, they may have those older beliefs, and I think it's about sharing with them the information that we have, uh, helping them to make an informed choice. So it really comes down to presenting the information we've gathered over the last 80 years on this procedure, especially in the last 20 years, there's been a huge acceleration in our knowledge, and then uh, presenting that to them and having them have a discussion with us. I obviously don't want you to violate any patient confidentiality mm -hmm. here, but if you could give us an example of, of someone who presented you know, these kinds of symptoms or problems, right. what you did, and how it improved their life. That would be helpful. Absolutely. So uh, when I was in medical school, uh, I, I saw somebody who actually um, was very influential in, in terms of uh, guiding me towards looking at interventions for psychiatry. This was an individual, I'm going to change some details, uh, uh, but this was an individual that had a severe depression who was not eating and was uh, basically tried on medications, was not doing well, and was heading towards a very dire pathway. 
ECT was offered to this person and this individual uh, struggled to make the decision for a little while, ultimately got the treatment and was fully in remission. And it was, it was one of those things that seeing that as a medical student, you see a treatment that you know, has uh, a background associated with it and then to see an amazing result stuck with me and it helped guide me towards wanting to pursue this uh, as a clinical and a research career. When you say fully in remission, what does that mean? So this is an individual who uh, couldn't take care of themselves and then within two to three weeks was completely symptom free, was able to go home, basically resume their lives. Do you know for how long? Uh, so in that, in that case, I don't know because this was somebody who was uh, on inpatient rotation. We, we know that um, one of the features of ECT is that it is our best acute antidepressant, so it can get people well in two to three weeks, whereas most medications take two to three months to, to show their effects. Uh, there needs to be some sort of maintenance ECT to keep the effect going. And we know that without any maintenance, relapses can occur. So there's been a uh, huge growth in the last 10 years about different ways to maintain the response. And uh, when doing that, it can keep most people well, uh, over 80% of people well in some studies. Maintenance means repeat treatment how often? So that varies. So there was a, a large study which was published a couple years ago which suggested the first month after successful ECT, if people received weekly ECT and then as needed ECT for the next six months where it could be zero uh, per week or one or two, it can keep people well. Do you think more people should be trying this? That can be a tough question. I, I think it should be um, presented more as an option for people where medications have not worked. Uh, both Peter Center and our center are also working on some slightly less invasive alternatives to try before ECT, um, things like uh, focused ultrasound, like uh, uh, RTMS, or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, I think the government can do a lot by helping us to uh, offer these treatments under OHIP, uh, the newer treatments, to, to try and decrease the stigma around brain stimulation as a whole. Ma'an, there's a song that you sing. After you have been through hell in this play, and your family has been through hell in this play, there is a song called There Will Be Light. What do you infer from that? Well, uh, from my character's standpoint is that after she's gone through all the uh, possibilities for, for getting better, for wellness, for therapy, and none of it was working, it's the acceptance finally of uh, what had happened to her, the grief, and that, that it's okay to live with that pain. Um, and there are ways to find joy in other things despite the pain. Um, and yeah, and so that there will be light in terms of other, um, uh, for me, the theater is such a, it's a place for healing, um, or it provides an opportunity for healing, not just for the people that are on stage, but for those that witness what's on stage. So I think at the end of the day, um, it's that connection with another human being that is the most powerful way to heal whatever is going on in your heart, in your mind. Um, because I think at the end of the day, that's where it all stems from, like a, um, not having been understood or being heard or not being able to express what it is that they're, they're feeling as a human and not having those needs met as a human, I think is essentially where our disease or disease comes from. So there's, there's, um... There's, an, I guess, a disagreement in the play, within the play, mm -hmm. about what your character suffers from. We mm -hmm. have the diagnosis from the psychiatrist, mm -hmm. Louise Petra, mm -hmm. plays her in the play. But I don't know, does your character agree with what you've been diagnosed to be suffering from? I think that, like I said, because she, because the loss happened at such an early age, their facility was immediately go, and her husband and them being, you know, intellectuals, oh, we need help, let's do this, let's do this. So uh, as opposed to actually dealing with the pain that has occurred, it, it, if for, in her case anyway, I feel like it was blanketed by all sorts of other immediate um, solutions to, without actually addressing the real problem. Because mm. hmm. the, the, the suggestion in the play is that your character is bipolar. Yes, or was diagnosed. Or was diagnosed mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. Do you think your character is bipolar? Um, I honestly think that she was dealing with grief mm -hmm. and wasn't over the loss of a child. Yes, and wasn't able to process that grief. 
properly. Hmm. Here are, these are some of the lyrics that you have to sing. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna make you sing them here, <laughs> although I'd love to, but uh, you know, you gotta do it eight Come times a week already. Show. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I will ask the two professionals here on the set. Uh, here, here's the lyric from one of Ma'an's songs. Do you wake up in the morning and need help to lift your head? Do you read obituaries and feel jealous of the dead? It's like living on a cliffside, not knowing when you'll dive. Do you know, do you know what it's like to die alive? And I want to know whether that's, how good a definition of mental illness is that? Mm. I think that's something that people can definitely experience. I think that mm -hmm. would resonate with a lot of people who have depression or severe depression. Mm -hmm. Peter? Absolutely, so suicidal thoughts, if I can infer that from, mm -hmm. uh, from the lyrics, uh, can be part and parcel of severe mental illness. Uh, we know ECT actually is something that can improve suicidal ideation uh, quite quickly. So um, there's a connection there between the lyric and, uh, and, the, and what happened in the play. What are you doing at Sunnybrook in terms of virtual reality to yeah. help with all of this? So um, one, of the, one of the things that is um, perhaps limiting the use of ECT is, as we talked about, stigma. And part of that could be patients and their family don't know what to expect with the procedure. They go into a room and then what happens next may be a mystery. So what we've done is we've started a virtual reality study where we have uh, the entire procedure at Sunnybrook uh, recorded in uh, 360 degrees, and an individual puts on the, the VR goggles and can look around and see the entire procedure from the nurse coming to them and greeting them, the, the explanation that the IV is gonna go in next, taking them literally down the hallway so they can look around, seeing the anesthesiologist, seeing the psychiatrist, seeing the machine, basically um, to break down the mechanics uh, of the procedure and that we think can uh, alleviate a significant degree of anxiety and may uh, help people to decide that this is something for them. How long do you think it'll take before ECT is not as stigmatized <laughs> as Cuckoo's Nest has apparently made it? <laughs> well, I can tell you that when I, I taught medical students this year, they had not seen Cuckoo's Nest. And so their frame of reference already, was, right? yeah, mm, it's, yeah. It, it was out a while ago, mm -hmm. um, 1975, I yep. think. Uh, and, and so the their image of ECT was from something more recent from Homeland, which was it's actually a little more well portrayed Homeland, there. the TV show? Yeah, correct. Oh, so okay. uh, I think we're working on it. And I think the more we talk about it, just like with mental health, the, the better the better hmm. we can do. Ma'an, I, um, you know, obviously people go to the theater because they want to be entertained, mm -hmm. but the added advantage, I think, of your show is that, boy, does it give you a lot to think about as well at the yeah. same time. And I'd like to know what you hope people are thinking about as they walk out of the theater after watching your show. That they are not alone in their aloneness. Hmm. That's a beautiful way to put it. Because mm -hmm. you see a lot of that out there, eh? A lot, yep. of, a lot of loneliness. Mm -hmm. I think especially nowadays, I think we're, we're so disconnected mm -hmm. that I think it's important. <clears throat> Theater allows us or gives us permission to, for that moment or for that brief three hours, mm -hmm. just to at least open yourselves up to it's like it's allow, It's listening. You're actively listening to one another. Mm -hmm. Like even me on stage, I can feel you listening to me. And mm. so it's, it's a very powerful tool. I don't know if you do this after every show, but after the one I saw, there was a mm. Q&A with the audience. Mm. Do you do that after every show? No, not every show. Sometimes. Not, not every show. Um, as, as you know, it's, it, it's a very draining mm -hmm. um, show, especially when I have another one um, following up and also I go home in between to feed the kids dinner so um, there's also that aspect of my life like the theater is just like this tiny little bit of who I am um, but yes uh, the talkbacks are very informative and also an extended way of again reaching um, people I think at the end of the day uh, that's what we're here for. It's uh, it's more important to be the human being than it is really to be the artist. I mean, you're an artist in effect to affect people in that way, so. You got three kids, right? I do. What day do you do two shows? Uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays. Wednesdays and Saturdays you mm -hmm. do two shows. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna go in, you're gonna do a matinee, then you're gonna come home and feed the kids, and mm -hmm. then you're gonna go back in and mm -hmm. do another show. Exactly that. Okay, am I allowed to say this here? Your life is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a load. Yes. 
Do you love you it? You know, most most people have that much of a load, I believe. You know, it doesn't make me any more special than them. Um, yes, it is, a, it is quite the load, one day at a time. Well, uh, let me say it's a little more special because you've got a room full of people who are watching you do what you do mm. and kind of, you know, sitting in judgment about whether or not they like what you do. And at the performance I went to, they were all on their feet within a half a second of uh, the lights going down. So congratulations. Thank you so much. I Next to normal. That. It's a great show. It's at the CAA Theatre in downtown Toronto through the 19th of May. Run. Don't walk to see it. Thanks to Ma'an Janisho and Peter Giacobbe uh, for being on that side of the desk and mm -hmm. Daphne Vonescos uh, from the Temerity Centre uh, on the other side of the desk. Uh, really appreciate all of you coming in tonight and good luck with the rest of your run. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you all. for having me. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.